Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Brian Malinsky. I met Brian at the Texas Custom Knife Show 2023 just last week where he won best in show for the EDC category with an exquisite folder of Damascus, mammoth ivory, and skiff bearings. He says he's new to folder making, but you'd never know it from looking at his folders. Uh, Brian's fixed blades are also beautifully composed and detailed, yet practical, and have earned, earned him features in many a knife magazine and book. We'll find out about Brian's work and why so many people confused us at the knife show. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and share the show with a friend. And as always, if you want to help support the show, you can do so by going to Patreon. Quickest way to do that is go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ryan, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. Hey, it's a pleasure to see you again. That, it was a really fun uh, weekend uh, at the Texas Custom Knife Show in Conroe. And uh, man, you and I just kept bumping into each other. So uh, it's really good to see you here. You as well. Yeah, that was that was something else. <laughs> <laughs> it was indeed. Well, congratulations on winning uh, Best EDC at uh at that show it was man i i can't imagine ed seeing that knife it was something exquisite tell us about that knife uh it's it's a folder but a little bit more than we're used to yeah no thank you so it was a uh stainless damascus blade with a a uh, inlay thumb stud with uh ivory mammoth ivory that matched the the handle material as well so Mammoth ivory handles and titanium fittings, titanium linings, and uh, it was running skiff bearings in that one. And you had all sorts of engraving in the bolster, right? Not all sorts, that's, but you had engraving in the bolster, right? Yeah, that's right. I had Tyler Poor uh, do the engraving for the, the bolster on that piece, yeah. Okay, so, so and when I introduced myself and we started talking, um, you know, you said that you were relatively new to folder making. Uh, how did you, that, that was a surprise to me just because looking at it, obviously you have your chops from fixed blade making. Let's, let's talk about that and how you got started in knife making. You're in, you live in Texas, right? Uh, I do. A, a, uh, a knife friendly state I found out and uh, just a friendly state in general. Uh, but tell us how you got into knife making. Yeah, you bet. So about 17 years ago, um, I had become interested in custom knives. I had always grown up using them and such, just uh, with a family that enjoyed hunting, deer hunting and, and bird hunting as well. And uh, eventually had come across my first uh, custom knife that was just kind of enamoring. And I was curious to see if it was something that a buddy of mine and I could kind of replicate. And so that's kind of where it started. We started just fiddling around with some scrap metal and and wood and then uh shortly after that i met a family friend his name was rendon griffin and he was very well known in the the folding knife community and made some beautiful uh hidden automatics and that's kind of where it started there were other mentors i'd love to share here in a little bit but that's kind of what kicked it off it's hidden automatics so those are uh, like scale release kind of things or yeah, yeah, bolster release. So you just touch the bolster and, and the knife will come flying out. And I just thought those were amazing. And so he helped me with fixed blades at first and then uh, passed away as we were getting ready to start uh, start exploring the kind of the world of automatics. So, yeah. Well, did you, uh, so you started with fixed blades. How did you go from scrap metal and pieces of wood, as you put it, uh, to making some of those uh, fixed blades I saw on your table and uh, in the magazines? Yeah, so jumped into fixed blades and just uh, really got some great encouragement from Rendon. And then uh, 
you know, just exploring some some different mentors out there and visiting with different knife makers uh, really helped a ton. And I uh, had a chance to spend a little bit of time with Bob Mers, and he was just super encouraging. And then uh, the Texas Knife Makers Guild a couple of years ago just got some really good feedback there that, that helped and encouraged me to up my game and, and kind of explore some other venues as well. So I saw uh, they had quite a presence uh, at the show, the Texas Knife Makers Guild. Texas in general seems to be a, a very proud place. Um, and a lot of people who come out of Texas seem to give the state credit for a lot of their own success, which I think is cool. I, I like that sort of a be true to your school mentality uh, that I really like, or I guess be true to your state in this case, obviously. Uh, but um, Texas Knife uh, Makers Guild, how how do you get involved with them, and what is you know what does that do for you? Sure. So you take three knives that you submit for testing with three of the uh, three of the members, and then they review each one of those according to uh, different requirements, fit and finish, obviously, um, practicality, I guess, as well. But then they give you good feedback, and and you're either and kind of growing through different hammer ends that they offer or if you don't make it in you know they give you some very specific uh, things to focus on and then they try to introduce you to some other folks in the guild as well that might come alongside you to to help you kind of tweak those things that that might need a little bit of working on so yeah Okay, so obviously, before you got into the Texas Knife Makers Guild, there was a long period of time where you're figuring it out. And uh, so uh, tell us about that. How did you figure it out? How did you um, kind of make your way into the more exotic steels and materials and the um, and the finer prop, prop processes? No, that's good. So early on, I, I think it was more ignorance than anything. I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I kind of started with some materials that I probably shouldn't have spent as much money on and <laughs> jumped right into Damascus uh, in the in the very beginning, which is a little bit uh, longer process as far as etching and finishing and refinishing and refinishing. But, um, but it was a learning process. So a lot of it was kind of... Uh, you know, hit and miss in the very beginning and then asking questions and uh, talking to different makers. I didn't get on YouTube too much to explore that yet because when I first started, there weren't a lot of, uh, you know, this was 17 years ago or so. This was before the Forge and Fire television series came out, which really kind of spurred on a lot of interest uh, and makers sharing how they do what they do via YouTube and what have you. So a lot of it was just kind of, explore and hope for the best well you said you jumped right into damascus let's talk about the process are we talking stock removal here or are we talking about uh, forging out billets and such yeah so stock removal stock removal and uh you know I, I i never did get into forging my own damascus i didn't have a power hammer i didn't have the shoulder to to bend and twist, you know, 300 times to, to get that cranked out. And my shop is uh, part of my garage where we're in a, a pretty populated uh, subdivision. So hammering is not really encouraged <laughs> in our area. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it was an interesting uh, environment there at, at the Texas Custom Knife Show. It was kind of... Uh, half and half he, there was a very um strong representation of the forgers uh that festival or that uh, show is built around the forged in fire um uh, model and and uh kind of uh was started by alum of that show alum alumnus <laughs> alumni of the show and uh uh, but but there was also a a strong contingent of stock removal uh, knife makers and people doing folders and and uh, it was a, an interesting uh, variety uh, there. But uh, so so you let's talk about how you develop the style of your fixed blade knives, the ones uh, that I have seen. Um, I I did a little homework on you, saw uh, numerous. Um, 
in installments in magazines and then in that annual book that comes out from is it knife magazine uh, i love that book i have uh one year of it here um uh so tell me how you developed your style was it through a uh you said you came from a hunting family uh, is it a practical need yeah it really did begin that way so all the knives that I made for the first, uh, goodness, I'd say five years were all uh, hunting style blades, you know, with just kind of a, a typical drop point with a little belly and, and practical for skinning and uh, some embellishments. I always enjoyed file work. So I, I kind of started with file work even early on and included that in many of uh, my knives. And then as, as uh, time went on, I, I kind of got involved in a couple of uh, I don't know if you go as far as call them art knives, but just more th thematic knives that I introduced, you know, a few a year. I got a, to do one for the, uh, the owner of the Ferrari race team and, uh, did use some carbon fiber there and some, uh, wheel caps to, to uh, embellish it with. So that was a lot of fun and, uh, did one recently that was for a, honeybee company and the scales look like honeycomb and that one seemed to be interesting to folks so is it that one right there on screen on the right that's it yeah oh, that's that one cool. on the right yeah that right. was a lot of fun that's beautiful so this is this is what we're talking about ladies and gentlemen this this sort of uh uh intricate very detailed uh this is the kind of thing you had on your table and this is what drew me to your table up uh, also that file work that you mentioned before I, I got a couple of questions here i'll, I'll double back to this one but uh, since we're talking about the file work um you mentioned somewhere uh on your website that you're a christian you're a christian knife maker and if other people resonate with that and they want that represented in their knife that they order from you you have a different ways you can represent uh different biblical motifs tell us about that yeah right so that's just that's just been kind of the the fun on the artistic side of things is to be able to create different patterns of using different shaped uh steel files and and working that into it so uh just with a vine theme and then also some crosses that i'm able to file out uh just on the top spines of some of the blades and have enjoyed that it's been fun yeah, that's I, I like that. Uh, if if that's a, <clears throat> you know, if religion is a meaningful thing in your life, I love that that is uh, something that you can have personalized into your blade. Um, but uh, you mentioned Ferrari. You made a knife for the Ferrari race team. How did that come about? And how did you go about designing a knife, making a knife for that purpose? Yeah, so it was it's kind of funny how that came about. I've, I've done one for them and for Hennessy, and uh, the one with Ferrari. A good friend of mine is a, a Ferrari supercar collector, and so he's good friends with the owner of the race team, and uh, his name is Giuseppe. And he actually came over from Italy to Houston. He was sent over by Enzo Ferrari to bring Ferrari to North America, and so we got to have lunch and kind of talk about the movie as it came out a couple of years ago with Ferrari versus Ford or Ford versus Ferrari, I guess. And, uh, kind of see, you know, what was, what was true in the movie and, and what was maybe embellished for Hollywood, but it was all pretty accurate from what it sounded like. And, uh, so my friend as a, as a gift to him had, had, uh, asked that I make that for him. And we styled it over the, the silhouette of the La Ferrari car. So it's kind of got that shape, the the top line of the the La Ferrari. Jeez, nice work if you can get it here. Go go to go to America and bring them the Ferrari. Okay, I'll do it. That's, <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, is that is that the knife that has the thumb um, thumb rest in the back that uh, is pretty uh, one of your biggest designs uh, that we've seen? It, no, it's actually a kind of a unique design of its own. I think it's on the website there, but it's it's black carbon fiber with some red racing stripes and I think G10, G10 bolsters. And uh, then the tire caps are inlaid in the, the handles on each end. But yeah. That's, I love that. 
All right. So let's let's talk about your your continued development. Uh, you you begin uh, making knives. You're you're making fixed blades. You jump right into the the uh, the the uh, expensive exotic materials. You get all these interesting collaborations. How does it happen? Um, how does this fit into your life? Um, you know, uh, as as you go. I, I presume you didn't start as a um, full-time knife maker. No, that's right. And I, I'm still not a full-time knife maker or, I, well, you could, I guess you could call it a, a very full part-time knife maker. So I, I do about, I spend anywhere from 20 to 30 hours in the shop each week. So it's a, wow. it's, a it's kind of a heavy schedule. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I think in the next year to come, as that kind of progresses, I'm looking at, you know, maintaining the fixed blades, but definitely adding maybe 50% of, of my personal production in the form of these kind of finer folders, if you will. So looking forward to it. So do you have a structure where um, you have books and uh, people, oh, man, that one in the center uh, was... Was, oh, that orange handled one right above yeah, there. Yeah, God, that's so beautiful with the. Uh, yeah, that that folder just above that one. That one sold at the show there. Yeah, yeah, that one. That's yeah, that the was one. That one. Dag and that orange kind of popped on there. I thought. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, uh, moving moving into the folder realm must have been a little bit intimidating, uh, because. There's so much activity over there and people are so particular. So how did you approach uh, starting to make uh, folders? Yeah, so that's been a that's been a big jump, honestly, uh, you know, just having to kind of retool some of the shop to, to prepare for that. It's it's a different style build. And um, I had developed a friendship with Elliot Maldonado. He's a, a folder maker. Uh, just outside of San Antonio in Texas and lives in a community of, oh goodness, there's got to be seven or 10 really well-known um, knife makers right there in that area within about 10 square miles of each other. And so as years have gone by, I did a little bit of leather work for him and his folders because that's just another area of the, the knife making uh, part that I enjoy a lot. And uh, one day he invited me out to his little ranch to to come and learn how to make folders and so we spent several days together and you know talked talked all things knives and theory and you know and design and uh, by the time we finished we had made our first one together and I've, I've actually got one of those here oh yeah uh, with me it's uh i don't know how much you'll be able to see maybe i can get my hands out of the way oh but, wow so this was the first one and that was the first one this was the first one yeah okay. yeah so it's got blue titanium liners that we anodized with jeweling on the inside and then a damascus backspacer with copper that kind of runs down the middle there but and what is that uh is that mammoth ivory uh, there? mammoth ivory yeah mammoth ivory with titanium pins and pivot wow and then the the thumb stud is a mammoth ivory as well that matches the handle and some sort of damascene blade there yeah um, yeah it's a stainless damascus blade with kind of a, a darker edge so yeah man, that is gorgeous yeah. now and, and, and let me see the um the uh bolster please yep that engraving so how did you get that done so Tyler Poor did, did my engraving on this one as well. Mm, and, you know, we kind of talked through some general ideas, but, you know, pretty well let him run with it. And he does beautiful work. Is that, what is that, like a fleur-de-lis pattern or something? Or... That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah. That was, that was a lot of fun. He did a great job on that with the, mm. with the uh, engraving. Okay, so yeah, you said that that's your first folder, and of course I believe you, um, but uh, that's really like looks very, very, very polished and high end for a full first folder. And I I understand that that this was sort of a collaborative effort, or at least someone was guiding you uh, through the process. But um, have you always been 
handy or even artistic uh, in nature? You know, I don't know that I, I could say that I was until I really started exploring knife making. I, th I think it was a side of me that I was always interested in, but had never explored the artistic side of things. You know, I was always kind of in the sports and business and and uh, didn't really have an outlet for it and, until I reached my 40s and uh, or late 30s, I guess. And when I jumped into this, kind of realized that I really enjoyed some of the design side of a lot of this. And then, you know, once you've been making knives and you understand the the proper approaches to grinding and kind of natural curves of, of what appeals to most as far as shape, you know, then you can kind of, I feel like you can, you know, take it with good mentoring and be able to apply it. If you have the, you know, some strong basics to, to start with. And that was something just spending time with Elliot really helped with. And, uh, you know, the, the technicalities of the precision with what goes into one of these folders, understanding that there's, you know, there's still tweaking here and there, but that's one thing he and I have talked about a little bit more is he's got a passion and a heart for, for sharing the trade. And that's part of what the guild's about as well. So he and I have talked about down the road, maybe working together on doing some classes, some folder making classes for guys that are already making knives. So they understand how to grind blades out and that sort of thing. And going from there. This is uh, the way of making a folder that is very different uh than a lot of different i mean so i talk to people who design them have them made i talk to people who design them and then have machines you know in in their own um say garage like you uh that and and the art there is programming it and designing in this virtual mm -hmm. space and um so it's amazing and and they create amazing knives and then you this is like uh do you remember in the early 2000s, late 90s, the slow food thing. Uh, there was this whole concept of slow food. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was basically eat slower, cook slower, be more mindful. Um, and uh, that's that's great. And it seems like that is the way you're making folders. It's like a, each folder is its own special case as opposed to figuring out a way to replicate them. Is, is that, is that accurate? You know, it, it is, uh, right now it, I think it will move toward the point of having some just really good templates and kind of sticking with maybe four different designs, uh, to be able to, you know, to be able to maintain the precision more than anything. Cause once you start, tweaking folders and coming up with different designs, then you've got to kind of, you know, you've got to make sure that everything fits together correctly, right? Your stop pin is in the right place. The pivots in the right place, your detents in the right place. And so there's, there's value in landing on some designs that you prefer. And I think, you know, our theme so far has been that keeping kind of, uh, uh, somewhat of a recognizable Western feel to a lot of these. And that's probably what we'll try to maintain kind of moving forward. Uh, with your fixed blades, uh, how um, uh, accurate or not accurate, that's not the right word. How the same are they from one to another within the same model line? And is that something you know what I mean? Can you be more flexible there than you can with the engineering of a folder? For sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I might change a, a finger swell a little bit on a fixed blade or a clip point, um, the belly on it. You know, some folks like a little pointier. Some people like a little, uh, a little deeper belly, depending on how they're using it. So definitely a lot more flexibility. But if somebody says, hey, I want 10 of this particular one, they're going to be real close. Right. Yeah. Okay. So your folders, how do you envision them being used? Now we, we talked about your fixed blades at your table and as beautiful as they are and as, uh, you know, um, uh, just ornate kind of as they are, they're very practical. They're hunting knives in, in many cases, outdoors knives, uh, but just very, very beautiful. How do you see your folders being used? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I, th I think it's kind of relative to the person that's buying it, right? If it's a, uh, for some, it's very much an investment and they're going to stick it away and collect them. And for someone else, they may choose to use it every day as their go-to knife. And it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It kind of, it kind of strikes me as unique every time I, I sell a knife. It's, you know, the, uh, the awe is not lost on me that somebody has chosen something that you made with your hands to pay you for. And then it's, it's a piece of their everyday life. So I think each one of them is definitely special and it's kind of tough to see each one go too after you finish them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I bet, I, you know, um, I've asked people about carrying their own knives and, you know, most people cannot afford to carry their own knives. You, you know, and I would imagine in your case, that's especially the case because they're, they're very valuable and they take a long time to make relatively speaking, you know, wow, you that's... can't just, yeah, that's a good word. No, I, I think this first one, I'll, uh, you know, that we shared a second ago, I'll, I'll definitely hang on to that one. I, I regret I didn't hang on to my first fixed blade that I made years ago. And, and I can't recall who bought it either to kind of try to track it down. Yeah. I've, I've come across some from the earlier days, but, but I, I'm not sure who has those, those first three or four. So when you um, started working on folders, what did you find is the biggest challenge, whether it's in terms of your thinking, you know, how you think about the design or, or whether it's the making the lockup, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, both of those very, are very, you know, both of them are big factors for sure. So the design you've got to make one or two to decide if you like that design and is it really going to hold up down the road to make more of those? Um, but yeah, I think part of it was kind of working with different materials. So I wasn't accustomed to using titanium and the liners for these are made out of titanium. And so when you're, when you're uh, grinding them to shape to begin with for your, your skeleton of the knife, you've got to be careful not to, uh, not to heat harden them because eventually you're going to have to drill holes in them. You're going to have to thread those holes and they've got to be dead on. And uh, it's not necessarily you, something that you think about when you're using knife steels as much. Right. So there's little nuances that I've bumped into that have been fun to explore and fun to start over. Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Show us that knife again. You keep glancing over at it. Let's see. Yeah, again. yeah. So is this one also uh, with skiff bearings and and? You know, I think that's a really cool and interesting um, thing is to have this sort of um, old west themed in a way knife um, with all of with the ancient material and some of the classical materials, and yet you have the the skiff bearings. Uh, tell me about the 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 thought behind that. Yeah, yeah. So this this first knife was actually with stainless bearings and uh, stainless steel bearings. And it's, it's super smooth. I mean, it just, it's got, you know, it just, it comes right out and, and, and catches and they feel great. But with the skiff bearings, I think, I don't know, maybe it's mind over matter type of thing, but it, it feels just a hair smoother with the ceramic bearings and the, the bronze phosphorus caging. Um, they might be, a, the caging may be a little thicker. So you've got to look at counter boring in the blade. A little bit deeper um, but as long as you're not getting super deep and and uh, compromising the integrity of the the uh, the blade itself then it's not an issue so that they, they hold up really well but, yeah. let's talk a, let's talk a little bit about your uh, your process uh, you were talking about counter boring and the blade and all this and i'm wondering what does that all look like for you in your shop um it is it all hand tools tell me about it Sure, sure. So uh, several different drill presses that uh, I like to kind of keep set up with with different drill bits or with uh, uh, with uh, different. Uh, oh, what am I trying to say here? To but anyhow, several different drill presses. I can kind of go from one to the next without having to waste time with with untooling, retooling, and all that, and then. Okay. 
I haven't gotten a mill yet. I'm working on getting the mill in here in the next week or two, which is really going to help with some stuff that I've been doing on the drill press that is not recommended to do with your drill press. <laughs> <laughs> like milling? Yeah, so, so counterboring the uh, the bolsters and such. And, and you know, you're kind of hanging on for dear life because <laughs> drill presses aren't just made for, for that kind of uh, sturdiness, you know, as it's going that quickly. So, yeah, it's uh, looking forward to some new tooling to add to the shop. So do you work in uh, any any sort of like batch form or are you really like one knife at a time? How, how does that work for you? Yeah. So, uh, with folders, it's, it's one at a time with, with the folding knives and then with fixed blades, I'll typically like to work on two or three at a time just because of, you know, you can be a, a little more judicious with your heat treating and, and, you know, running of electricity in the shop and that sort of thing. So, uh, and then also just when you're grinding those blades, you can use the same, same size wheels without changing out as much and the same grit belts going from blade to blade. And it just, it helps to make the, the time more efficient and your, uh, just your shop overall a little more efficient as well. So, so efficiency is a huge name of the game, especially for a small, uh, knife making company. <clears throat> How did you decide when what was it like when you came to the point where you realized i i guess i need to make a business out of this knife making uh hobby that i keep doing yeah it, it kind of crept up up on me pretty early on just with friends and family at first of course you know they just always want to encourage you and support you and so it was a a knife here and there and then uh, a good friend of mine in, from college became a, a knife collector and and also purchase them as gifts for his clients. And uh, it just kind of continued to grow to a point where maybe three years in, I started keeping a little bit of a, a waiting list, if you will, just a client list and building through that. So at that point, you know, it became a little more important to to plan ahead on the work and, and make sure that you could deliver within reasonable amounts of time. And And now that things are getting to be a little more involved with materials and and just the work on these folders it's uh it's it's probably going to move more towards where i'm making stuff that i enjoy making and just making that available uh for purchase down the road here that's uh it, it seems like that's when you know you've arrived you know uh, people uh, it seems like knife makers in the beginning have to um kind of open up books so to speak and and have a list that they're going through. Um, but it seems like there comes a time in every custom knife maker's um, path where uh, if they're lucky enough, they can do that. Um, uh, either they have a head of steam or uh, or that's become their career, but, or, or I guess there's enough demand that they can just make the knife and there there's someone there who's gonna want it. And I think that that's, to me, from the outside, that seems like the ideal situation. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. That's, you know, it, 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 but it is kind of a mixed blessing too. You, you definitely have the core group of collectors that kind of follow you and and support you, and so you want to kind of be sure that you know if if they want something made that they know that they're going to get it. You know, and. Uh, but at the same time, having the time and, and the wherewithal to be able to make enough to provide them for open sale so that those that are looking for them can grab one if they want one. Right. And you can right, uh, broaden your appeal to a, a wider audience. And and uh, well, what what becomes the goal for uh, a knife uh, company such as yours? Like, um, is it is it growth? or is it uh, maintaining or is it the f creative freedom? Yeah, I think for me with it being, you know, truly handcrafted one person in the shop, right? I don't have a team of folks working with me. Um, that it, my goal is to, to keep it at a certain number of knives per year to where I know that I'm not, uh, I'm not pushing my personal boundaries with, with work, which is my primary focus with my family. And, 
you know, allowing the time that I know I have available to be able to make X number of knives at a certain quality. And so it's, it's really bringing in more of the time for creativity in the next year and, you know, maybe less, less number of knives and higher quality creative, uh, ness in the knives. So what about the business, uh, part of, of Malinsky knives? came to you as a surprise or what is your other background? And you said business and sports. So maybe it seems you already had a business head going into this, but uh, tell, tell, tell me a little bit about that. What, what you were bringing into this uh, on the business side and what you found out about the knife world that may have been surprising. Sure. Sure. So I've been in, I serve as an associate minister at one of our churches here in Houston. And so I've been doing that for about 20 years and Prior to getting into ministry, I had my own uh, oil and gas recruiting firm where we did executive search for exploration as geosciences. Mm -hmm. And so that was my company. So I learned a lot about just, you know, kind of the ins and outs of running a small business from your own marketing to your own accounting, uh, working a desk, sales. Uh, and I feel like that's helped tremendously with this. Right, because you're having to design your knives. You've got to show the public what you're doing and hope that they like it and share in the, the right circles of influence that, that you might have uh, based on, you know, your backgrounds and what you've done. So that's been, uh, it's been fun to, to use the different, you know, different talents that you've acquired through experience. But yeah, in the latter part, what was the last thing that you asked? Well, I, I think that that that's pretty much what what I was uh, getting at. I mean, uh, Doug Markaita at the show. I don't know if you heard this. You were probably busy selling your knives, but he uh, was doing a Q and A, and he was uh, he was saying that it was very important to follow your passion, and uh, if your passion is knife making, very important to do that. But it's equally important to find out how to actually survive doing it, and that means taking business courses and, and figuring out how to market your stuff. I mean, he's a Kali martial artist. The, you, you wouldn't think that there's much of a career beyond teaching Kali martial arts, but he has managed mm -hmm. to make a nice career. Like he's got his finger, his hands in a lot of different things. And I thought his advice was pretty sage um, in those terms. Uh, from your perspective, what would you say uh, to someone who's got a passion for knives uh, but but maybe uh, maybe not so much for business. Yeah, and I think that's a great question for especially for this industry, kind of the handcrafted knives side of the industry, right? Because you see a lot of craftsmen, a lot of artists that they enjoy being in the shop by themselves and creating, you know, great knives, but maybe haven't really thought through. Oh, the business side of things or the interpersonal skills side of things. And I think it's super important. I, you know, I think back of what's helped uh, gearing up to jump into this, you know, a little heavier than what I had initially planned. And, you know, at, in school, I went to the hotel restaurant business school and uh, at University of Houston. And so we had a lot of focus because of the restaurant industry uh, in financials on the business side of things, because of how many restaurants tend to open and fail within goodness, within a year, really. And so I think that's, that's been super helpful, just having studied the, the different areas and then starting a, a small business prior to this certainly didn't hurt, but yeah. You know, uh, at blade show and, um, and at this show, every every knife show I've been to, but mostly, I guess I'd have to say, uh, with with those two shows in particular, uh, it really jumps out at me when you'll <clears throat> when you see someone who's obviously talented and you can tell from their work, but they're just not into engaging the public in any way. And um, I understand that 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 can be nerves, that can be you know. But it's something you have to overcome. It 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 absolutely is because um, I can't tell you how many custom knives I have and how many custom knife makers whose work I've fallen in love with after that initial conversation, where a good conversation leads to well, I can't afford any of this, but I'll buy that little thing. I know I can afford that little knife, 
And it starts something for me. And it all starts with that conversation. So you mentioned interpersonal skills, like, uh, you know, what do you, what do you say about, what do you say about that? How would you, how would you mentor someone, uh, going into their first knife show who's, uh, got great work, but maybe is a little tentative about reaching out to the public? Yeah. I, you know, that's a tough one. I haven't done a ton of shows, but I've, I've done a handful. And, you know, the first thing that I think I notice is just how many folks are sitting down behind their tables versus standing up ready to have a conversation with somebody or, you know, not being overly pushy, but being available and, and showing folks that you're interested in them being there for the, uh, for the show and looking at your stuff and, uh, just being ready to, to answer questions that, that may come up as folks are coming by your table to, to look and encouraging them to pick up your knives and, you know, see how they actually feel in your hand. And I think that's, uh, I think that's the biggest thing really is just, you know, showing people that, that you want to be there and you want to interact with folks. And I know for some, some people that's, uh, that's harder than others, but yeah. just finding common ground, right. Finding common ground with folks quickly and, and being able to have a conversation is just some of the basics. Uh, I think I think what you said there, um, just about standing up, is a huge part of it, uh, because you might not be good with words, but if you're standing up, you're showing, uh, yes, you know, I'm ready to engage. But if you're not good with words and you're sitting down, you know, it's going to make it so easy for people to walk by, glance over, walk by. Um, and, and that makes me, um, I'm, I'm the sort of guy who drives by the restaurant that's closed down that, you know, just opened a year ago. And I'm like, Oh, I hate to see businesses fail. I hate to see that all of that personal passion, uh, go to waste, but you gotta, you gotta do the uncomfortable stuff too. Most definitely. Right. And, and there's some guys that, you know, they'll bring their, their wives with them or wives will bring their husbands with them if they're the maker and, or a good friend. And I think a lot of times that can help too, just to stay, you know, stay out of their shell a little bit. And I've, I've seen that work as a, a little self-motivating tactic for, for some folks. So, um, have you, um, well, have you compiled a list of the people that have inspired you and mentored you? Who, who are some of the, who are some of the names, uh, that have gotten you where you are? Yeah, yeah. No, I think going back to a couple I mentioned earlier with uh, Rendon Griffin and uh, especially Elliot Maldonado, he's just he and I have developed such a great friendship over the past few years. And, you know, he's poured a lot of wisdom that came over a lot of years. And I'm super appreciative of that. And his style, I think, is uh, something that I've been attracted to before, you know, before we met it was just his his knife designs seem to have uh, appealed to me. So that's what I've kind of tried to lean towards. Yeah. You know? How would you uh, describe them? I'm not familiar with his work. Yeah. Yeah. So he, uh, he's got a very kind of Western feel to his, he grew up on a, a horse ranch. His dad, uh, trained and sold horses and, uh, just, a, you know, hardworking family. And, uh, I, th I think his knives kind of display that a little bit, you know, and that area around San Antonio too kind of encourages that you've got Johnny Stout just up the road from him. And, uh, Oh goodness. I, I can't, they don't come to mind, but several others just right there, uh, in the same area, but versus, you know, you've got some slip joints and stuff that where you have some maybe common shapes, right. And you can rebuild those, but taking these liner locks, it just seems like, uh, it's just a little more fun to come up with some new designs, but still have a little bit of a, maybe a Western feel to them or gentleman's feel to them, but still having some, some different shapes to them. Well, yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I really like about your folders is that they're, they're a, um, uh, uh, mix up, if you will, you know, with the, the ancient materials and then the old treatment of the modern materials with the with the flirtily um engraving in the titanium and uh i i really like that i i love natural materials on modern folders and and yours uh they are modern folders they're titanium liner locks but man they're they're wearing uh traditional 
Texas dress, traditional Western dress. What is it about Texas? I've talked to a lot of people already on the show from Texas. And now having been to the show and meeting all these great other uh, knife makers in person, they'll, they'll be coming on the show too. What is it about Texas and, and knives? Yeah, that's a great question. The only thing I can, you know, I've thought about this and I, th I think it really goes back to just the, the old ranching days, right? You just had a, a big use for a pocket knife or a fixed blade on you that was handy for either cutting rope or cutting bags and, you know, heavily used on ranches down here. And then you've got, you know, Jim Bowie and, and the history there and the Alamo and all the knives involved there. So, I, yeah, I think there's just a lot of things that kind of point toward uh, the industry being pretty pretty heavy in the state for for knife making as well as some of some of our neighbors too with uh goodness arkansas and louisiana and yeah yeah that's funny uh when i went down uh before i went down there my wife was like you know tell me tell me what your impressions are of texas you know is it as liberty-minded as it seems and <laughs> and uh i got there and i texted her uh i just passed by a town called cut and shoot if that answers it i was like yeah <laughs> i love that That's um, right. yeah and 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 i always think of uh well uh your state in particular as um being uh a rugged individualist kind of place self-reliance kind of place yeah like i kind of put you on the same shelf with alaska that kind of uh, even though it's a totally different climb and a different history and everything, but uh, there's a certain ruggedness that goes into it and self-reliance. And to me, that's, uh, that's something that is always a knife has always been a symbol of to me since I was little, even though I didn't really quite get it, but it's self-reliance being rugged, having that knife on your hip and being able to do anything. Um, what about knives, uh, for you? Like, what is it that, keeps you coming back there's so many other things you said business and sports and those are normal things that normal people do but you also do knives why yeah you know i, I think it it's really goes back to the creativity and just finding a fun way to use that for something that's applicable to uh to a need and and to what a lot of guys use and and enjoy and women as well there's lots of uh, lady collectors that come by the shows and you know, there's so many different styles of knives that that you can play with and uh, jump into. But, you know, kind of going back to what you had mentioned earlier with using some of the old materials with the new materials. And, you know, it is kind of fun to see what makes sense together or what is just so opposing that you may not want them together on a knife. You know, you see that sometimes as well. And But, yeah, and just all the, the beautiful woods out there, you don't realize till you sand them down and shine them up that, that the inside of a tree could look like, you know, the way that it might with different, different woods that are out there. So it's, uh, it's always interesting to see, you know, you don't know exactly what it's going to turn out to until you really fine sanded the material down and, and maybe polished it or oiled it. And it's always kind of a surprise at the end. And that's, that's part of the fun. It's like you're uncovering it the whole way or just dis discovering it the whole way. Yeah. So what what are uh, what uh, feedback do you get from your customers, and what what is the work that these beautiful knives have been uh, up to? I'm I'm sure they're not all safe queens like they would be uh, in my collection. Right, right. Now you see a little bit of both. Uh, I got a picture yesterday of somebody skinning an axis deer with Ooh. with one that I actually didn't think he was going to use the knife much, but he did, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a lot of fun. No, there was a. I, th I think the surprise that a lot of folks have with custom knives is just the the quality of the work that they can do. Not not the knife maker, but the knife itself. And you know, having a, a proper ground shape uh, geometry on the on the edge of the knife with a proper heat treat for that particular steel, and the type of work that that knife should be able to do. So. For instance, there was a uh, there's a guide that I did two knives for uh, last year. So a, he wanted a skinning knife and a boning knife, and I think they cleaned 13 or 14 deer with those knives. And he said he didn't have to sharpen them, and so he dropped them a little bit afterwards. You know, I told him I said, well, that's that's really one of the major differences is 
you know, having a quality edge on, on the blade if it's done right. You know, I remember when I was a kid and the Buck 110 that I had, right, that a, a lot of folks have had. And this was maybe a 25, eh, probably a 30 year old knife. Uh, and I started skinning a deer and it was a great knife. And, and I'm sure they're super high quality now. But I remember having to sharpen that knife three times before I finished one animal. Oh, wow. And I thought that was normal. I didn't know any different, right? And so every time I skinned a deer, it was like, okay, I'm going to keep a stone right by me and, and some leather right by me. And I'm going to sharpen and strop, sharpen, strop, sharpen, strop. <laughs> wow. And, and a, a quality edge should be able to hold up to a little bit more than that. So. Yeah, and it's not just the quality edge. You mentioned it before. Uh, almost almost more than that is the geometry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the geometry and the heat treat. And the combination of the two, and and it's it's a different ball game. So, so how did you arrive at the geometry on your various knives? Uh, I, I know just from looking at them in person that uh, between the folders and uh, say the skinning or the folders and the fixed blade knives, there's a there's a bit of a difference. Sure, sure. So, you know, depending on the potential use of the blade determines how you should grind it. Right. And so on these folders and in talking with Elliot and, and others too, that, you know, we just really want to get them ground down to almost a, a zero grind on the edge before we put the very final cutting edge on. And so, you know, versus having a, a lot of more uh, backbone strength, maybe on a, a heavy skinner that might be used where you're going to be, you know, getting into some bone occasionally and, and what have you so just kind of the proper thickness the proper uh grind thickness right up towards the edge depending on what that use is so you're saying zero edge bring it to a uh basically a sharp point but then knock it off with a relief edge that is more oblique so you're not basically breaking the edge when you use it that's right that's right yep yeah. So that's just going to be wicked sharp right behind that edge. Or very yeah, thin. Espe especially with the uh, the folders, you know, they're going to be they're going to be coming to a almost to your your sharpened edge on the initial grind. So where do you see yourself taking Malinsky knives um, in terms of a company? Uh, this is a two parter, and well, I'll well answer that first. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the goal right now is to kind of maintain a, uh, a certain quantity of build for this next year and the year after that. And then, you know, as I get older, kind of near retirement age is to really kind of take it into being a, the full time income generator, if you will, and being able to spend more time out at various shows around the U.S. and, you know, maybe go into some art art knife shows to mix it up a little bit as well as, you know, some of the, you know, all the big blade shows. And that's something I'm looking forward to this year is doing blade Texas. I've not, I've not gone to that one just yet, but I'm going to make it out this year. So that should be a lot of fun and taking some, uh, some different folders. I've got another one here where we were talking about earlier before the show with just kind of traditional woods and different blades that's beautiful. What kind of wood is that? Uh, desert ironwood. Oh my god! It's kind of hard in this lighting. I know to to see the wow. the coloring in it, but that one's got a little more a little more downturn for a little bit of a western feel to it than the the other. Yeah, you're gonna get accelerated cutting with that down yeah. uh, angled blade. That's sweet. And the backspacer at Damascus with some copper in the Damascus. It's kind of hard to make out, but, but yeah. So what, what is, do you think working into your plan, could you have ever bring other people into the operation or is this strictly you and your work and, and that's it? Yeah, that's, that's a really tough question. I, I think, you know, my son and I have spent some time on this. He's a teenager in high school and he's enjoyed learning how to make knives. And the hope is not necessarily that he jumps into it, but he has the basic knowledge so that down the road, if it's something he chooses to do, that he's got that, you know, that tool in his belt, so to speak. But 
I think down the road there could be a mixture, right? There could be a mixture of kind of Malinsky signature series to where they're handcrafted by me and then maybe rolling in another individual or two that does uh, more of a mid-series or a, a mid-tech, if you will, right? That they're kind of creating some of my designs and, and you know, obviously I'm still putting eyes on each one before they go out and doing maybe a, a blended business model of if that makes if that makes sense yeah it does that's kind of how murray carter and uh carter custom cutlery uh that's how that's kind of how his business works it's it's interesting he brings on apprentices and they kind of work on designs that that he's created and they put their english on it and they put their stamp on it as well as his and it's kind of a a mm. way to feature the apprentice but also get his knives made you know it's it's an interesting um uh, it's a very similar model to what you suggest. So what what now would be your dream build? What is the knife you want to make that uh, at least right now seems out of reach, but you'd really love to make? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> you know, I guess a uh, an automatic with inlays. Ooh. So just kind of a, a super high end uh, folder. And I don't know, you know, again, that's a that's a dream build. I don't know how soon I want to jump into automatics, but I think up the road, it could be a lot of fun to, to play with at least. But uh, so, yeah, I was going to say, so it sounds like that answer has two comp complications, the automatic part and then the inlays part. I understand the engineering of the automatic, but for you, what what is the challenge with the inlays? Yeah, I, I don't I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have a pantograph. So that would be one challenge. Um, you know, I know now with with CNCs and water jets, there's a lot of different uh, approaches that folks are taking to do inlays and what have you. But I think uh, I think front and rear bolsters with engraving and engraving down the back spine is probably my in between jump. Uh, before okay. going that direction and i just i love the way those look and i, I just think they're they're kind of special you know you mentioned the panograph i have uh i i only have uh i have two custom folders in my collection and one of them was uh has a beautiful beautiful inlay on both sides it's a, a titanium frame lock and it's uh inlaid on both sides so mm. perfectly and it was done you know with a panograph just you know really no gapping no no and so it's it's cool to see a totally analog machine makes something so accurately um you know yeah i totally agree it's it's a craft of its own and uh you know i mentioned earlier maybe that i had a, a chance to go by bob Merz's shop uh, over in katie texas this past year and just a really neat guy very interesting background and uh his his service in the the armed forces i think is what kind of drew his uh interest in knife making but yeah he's got a couple of pantographs there where he does a lot of inlays in his his folders and they're just they're amazing they're beautiful the the fit and finish is is wonderful and so you know something that elliot worked with me on early on with the first one was just doing some rounded bolsters right to where you're having to get that fit and finish just perfect with your handle material and mm -hmm. uh, next we're going to start doing some s-shaped bolsters and and kind of jumping up the game a little bit if we can uh one last question uh if if you could have a knife from any maker right now um who would it be Ooh, that's tough uh you know being that he hasn't made me one i'd say elliot <laughs> all right i'm gonna have to I mean, check out yeah yeah i mean he's just got some beautiful blades out there and this is elliot maldonado right yeah okay yeah, so everyone yeah. go look him up yeah uh, i mean johnny stouts are beautiful too but i just you know ha having the friendship with him and and seeing you know seeing some of his at recent shows that won several awards you know, justifiably, I, th I think that would be at the top of my list. 
Well, Brian of Malinsky Custom Knives, thank you so much for joining me on the Knife Junkie podcast. It was so cool to meet you at the Texas Custom Knife Show. And by the way, people kept mistaking us all weekend long. Are you guys brother? No, it was, uh, oh, you make knives too? And I'm like, no. And then they were asking you if you had a podcast and the whole thing. Uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. That was a blast. No, up up until the end, I was getting in my car and somebody said, hey, Bob, I'm looking forward to being on your show. And I said, yeah, that's not me. It's <laughs> <laughs> funny, man. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure, Brian, and uh, I'll be talking to you soon, sir. Oh, thanks so much, Bob. I enjoyed it. My pleasure. Take care. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Brian Malinsky of Malinsky Custom Knives. Uh, really great to have him on the show. It was very nice uh, meeting him. And uh, man, uh, do yourself a favor. Go look him up on Instagram and check out his gorgeous work. Uh, I love that mix of the Old West with the, with the totally modern and the ancient materials. Uh, that really does float my boat. Uh, be sure to join us next week for another great interview and uh, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday, of course, for Thursday Night Knives. For Jim, working his magic behind his switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast